Luke 8, 22. One day, he, Jesus, got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let us go across, circle across, to the other side of the lake. So they set out. And as they sailed, he fell asleep, circle asleep, and a windstorm came down, circle down, down on the lake, and they were filling with water, and they were in danger. And they went, and they woke him, saying, Master, circle that, Master, Master, we are perishing, circle perishing. And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, circle ceased, and there was a calm. And he said to them, underline the sentence, where is your faith? Circle where. And they were afraid and they marveled. And they said to one another, who then is this that commands even winds and water and they obey, circle obey, they obey him. You ever been through a storm in your life? Could be exactly right now. Right now, we have a health storm with COVID, a la the way we have to do church. We have a cultural storm with what happened to Mr. Floyd. We have occupational storms. Some of you guys lost your jobs because of COVID, business shut down, whatever. Um, some of you guys have been with your spouse way too much these last three months, and like you got, you got a marital storm a raging. Um, many of us got storms. And this story right here, as we look at it, I hope really encourages you as you sail the storm, what's a way that you know during the storm, number one, that you know God's with you, because there's nothing worse than going through a difficult time not knowing is God there, and what might be God's purposes in sailing this storm. So if you got your notes, pull them out. They should be in your bulletin if you got a bulletin when you came in. Um, And number one is this, ready? Jesus proclaims the new journey. Jesus proclaims the new journey. So in this story, Jesus is with his boys. He's with his 12 disciples. They're getting ready to uh, cross the lake. And he is going to set them out on a new journey that they didn't get to choose. So Jesus right here is going to say, here's where we're going. Get in the boat. So look at this. After Jesus had done a rigorous nonstop tour of regional Galilee, preaching and healing, he decided to escape the crowd by crossing the Sea of Galilee. So everybody pay attention. So you know what's going on. Jesus right here is a rock star. Jesus at this time in his ministry, his ministry lasted about three and a half years. So pay attention. So you get some context. About two years, his first two years, he was untouchable. He was the Justin Bieber, DJ Khaled of his, you know, his age of 2000 years ago. He was like the, rave DJ or whatever at Vegas, right? And everybody went there except nobody's dropping Molly or doing drugs. So, you know, back in the day, Jesus is the most popular guy around. Like if you said, hey, you know Jesus? They'd be like, man, I wish I knew Jesus because I only get to see him like from afar. So watch, at this point in Jesus' ministry, which is right at the beginning of his ministry, he's been doing a nonstop tour of Northern uh, Israel, which is called Galilee. So Israel's a nation, Galilee's a region. Everybody with me? Okay, so here's a satellite map of Galilee. You see right in the middle right there is Nazareth. It's in red. That's where Jesus grew up. So that's a famous place that Jesus grew up. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which is southern Israel, down by Jerusalem. But he grew up in Nazareth. Joseph and Mary moved back to Nazareth. Well, at this point in Jesus' life, he's about 30 years old. It looks like Joseph has died. So if you grew up in a home where you didn't have a dad or dad died when you were younger or whatever, It's very possible that Jesus grew up without his father for the majority of his life. Uh, So by the time he's 30, he's the oldest male in his home. He's now taking care of Mary, his mother, and all of his younger siblings. He has now moved them from Nazareth to Capernaum. Capernaum is a little, it's small, but it's a little better of a city. It's got more industry. People obviously fish from there. This is where he's going to live and do ministry from is Capernaum. The reason I put that arrow on there is this story, they're leaving Capernaum on the shore and they're gonna go to the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. That's that's where they were heading. It's about a four to five mile journey by water and in a a rowboat or wind uh, aided, it's gonna take a few hours to make that journey. Entering the boat, 
His disciples followed him into the boat, and he then unveiled the destination and direction. And here's the thing. Sometimes you don't know where you're going until you decide who you're going with. So watch this. I love this story. Jesus goes, I got to get away from these people. Have you ever been exhausted? Anybody ever been exhausted? And everybody like, my mind can't fit one more piece of either information. My emotions can't handle one more like emotional trauma thing. Uh, my checkbook, my checking account can't handle one more bill. Like at some level, you just go, I, I, I'm just kind of cooked right now. I can't, I just, I'm going to turn off Facebook. I just can't handle any more information or any more buddy screaming or whatever. Like I just, I'm turning off CNN and TV. I want to throw my TV out on the street. Like I'm, I'm done. And you just, you want to curl up on your bed or your couch and just go, if, if somebody could just leave me alone for a few hours, I would be so appreciative. You know, and then right as you're falling asleep, you're having like a dream of coming back to the orchard. It's like a miracle or whatever, right? It's like the best dream you've ever had. And all of a sudden your kids are like, mom, he took my Oreos or whatever. Like somebody, you know, somebody's screaming. Well, Jesus, because he is a rock star, people are just hounding him. And he's finally like, I'm going to escape everybody by getting in a boat and going across a lake where nobody could follow me. So he tells his disciples, hey, everybody get in the boat with me. But you know what? He doesn't tell them the the destination or the direction. He just says, get in. We're going to get across. Now watch this. Many of us got drama in our life. We got journeys that we are on in our life, either marital, financial. Some of us have lost our jobs during covid Uh, or businesses, you know, haven't gone well. And so we're looking at all these new journeys and some of them, honestly, we don't want to be on. Some of these new journeys are pressed upon us. We didn't ask for them. Could be health issues, could be relational issues, could be whatever. And here's here's one thing I want to impress upon you. When Jesus tells you to get in the boat and he's not going to tell you where we're going. How many of you guys are uh, control freaks in here? Where's my control freaks? You write a list and you're like, this is how it's going to get done. A, B, C, D, F, G. And once we get to G, we're just going to keep on moving down uh, the alphabet. And once I get things done, you know, we've completed that list. Then we move on to the next list and things get done the way I want them done in the order I want them done in. Now, oh, wow. He's like, yeah. (laughs) Well, yes, actually that is true. That's exactly what happens in my home. Well, listen, ready? Here's the thing about control is what you realize after a while when things go wrong financially, with your marriage, with your parenting, um, with our culture. You realize you actually, control is a facade. Ultimate control is a facade. It's good to have a list. It's good to be organized. But ultimate control of your life is, is a facade. You can't control. Who could have, who could have predicted what happened with, with COVID or what happened uh, with Mr. Floyd? Who could have predicted these things would have happened to our culture? Nobody can. So watch what I'm saying. There's going to be moments in your life where God is going to say, get in the boat. You don't know where we're going, but I got you on the way. And that's tough for some of us because some of us are like, we need to have control. And if we don't have control, we feel insecurity. And when we feel insecurity, we feel we get depressed. We get, you know, anxious. We get, you know, irritated. We get irritable. So watch, whether you're a control person or not a control person, understand that you and I don't get to choose all the journeys of our life. God sometimes puts us on new journeys, whether we want to be on them or not. Sometimes they're great. Sometimes they're not so great. Sometimes it's a health issue. You have to deal with cancer and you're like, I didn't sign up for this journey. But God says, get in the boat because I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you on it. Sometimes you don't know where you're going until you decide who you're going with. And here's the principle. When God sets the course, he has already gone ahead of you and is with you. Wow. Wow. Look at that. When God sets your course, when God sets your course, he's already gone ahead of you to the place he wants you to be. So he's already gone before you and he's with you during the journey. Here's the tough, here's the tough uh, teaching for some of us in here. Listen, many of us have chosen journeys God didn't want us on. Many of us chose ways of living God didn't want us to go down. Many of us chose paths that God doesn't want us on. Many of us chose people we shouldn't be with, doing things we shouldn't do. And we know know it too. 
But we go, you know, this is what I want, or these are my desires or my dreams or my drives, and I don't really kind of care what God wants. Watch. And we set out on a new journey, and we're not following God. So watch what happens. All of life is a journey for all of us. Some journeys, God goes, I want you to come with me, and I will be with you. But some journeys we go, I'm not going there. I'm going this way. And God doesn't go with us. And we wonder why we train wreck our lives. We wonder why we just keep accumulating this regret and this baggage that we carry through our life. And it's the reality that when God walks with you, God not only knows where you're going, but goes with you in it. So when the storm comes, God gives you the strength to get through it. The problem is that many of us have chosen our own journey and said, I don't really care if God's with me or not. And we've train wrecked our life and we, we live with regret and pain, and issues that wouldn't have been with us if we had chosen godly. And here, here I want to lay it out super clear. When when you're tracking with God, you never have regret. There's been many times in my life I go, man, I regret that. I regret what I did with that person. I regret the way I acted. I regret what I regret. And you know what? Every single one of those times, God was not in those moments. God was not tracking with with my life. It was me that said, this is what I want. I don't really care if God comes or not. Well, the problem is you don't really care if God comes with you or not until stuff train wrecks. And then you're like, God, help. And God's like, I didn't leave you. You're the one who walked. But because I love you, I will meet you in your time of need. But here's the issue is that we accumulate all this stuff that didn't need to be in our lives if we would have walked with God. So watch, disciples get in the boat with Jesus and he goes, hey, I decide where we're going. Are you with me? And they're like, I don't know if we have a choice in this boat. But yeah, we're with you, Jesus. The disciples trusted Jesus' direction and were willing to go wherever he was going. And here's a principle for all of us. The worst decision you or I can make is one that relies on our own personal desires or data that we've collected to decide on our destination. The worst decision you and I will ever make is going, I, I, can get, I got this one. What do I want? I'm going to take an inventory of my desires and then I'll decide what I'm going to do. The worst, listen, the worst decision you and I can ever make is going, I'm not going to take any godly counsel into account. I'm not going to take scripture into account. I'm just going to go with how I feel. Listen, Feelings are a train wreck waiting to happen. Nothing wrong with feelings. Feelings are fun. But feelings can't be your way forward all the time in everything because you're going to make bad financial decisions. You're going to make bad sexual decisions. You're going to make bad occupational decisions. You're going to move to Texas and wreck your life. You're going to do a whole bunch of stuff that that you're going to regret. All y'all are going to make bad decisions. Ready? Here's the thing. So how do I move forward with God? I will tell you, instead of making all the calls yourself, when those moments present themselves, like here's a new journey we could go on. Here's a person I could marry. Here's a job I could take. Here's a place I could move. I'm I'm feeling this way, but let me make sure God is with me. Right? Because everybody gets journeys to go on, but God doesn't go on all of them with us unless we make sure we're going God's way. is that you incorporate godly wisdom into, people, in, into your decision-making. You, you search scripture out. You, you ask pastors. You ask godly men and women in your life, if they're your parents or grandparents or whatever. You get godly input. Because guess what? Sometimes they're going to speak into your life and go, sweetie, do not marry that tool bag. He can't even spell Jesus. And somebody will save your bacon as a young lady going, praise God, I listen to grandmama. That's how, that's how you, it's, it's like, well, that's like for super spiritual holy people. No, it's not. It's for idiots like me and you that need a whole bunch of like somebody to speak some truth and love into our lives. And that's how you do it. It's not hard. But you just got to be willing to be obedient. And that's the hard part. Is actually doing. Look at Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. So if you got your physical Bible, open it up to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I've told you, if you've been around the orchard like at least a year, this, this part of your Bible should be beat up pretty good because I've told you to underline it and highlight it. I even told you to take an X-Acto knife out and cut it out. So if you actually listen to me, there should be a hole there uh, for Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Cut it out, put it in your mouth, eat it. Let it become part of your DNA. 
I love this verse. These are life verses. This is how you make decisions. This is how you not train wreck your life. This is how you raise your kids better. It's how your marriage gets better. It's how your occupation gets better. It's how a church gets better. It's literally how everything gets better. Why? Because God is for you when you want him in your decision making. God is against you when you kind of go, I don't really care what you think, God. I'm going to do whatever I want. Okay, but it's not God that, that's left. It's you and I that leave him. Look at this. Trust in the what? I've said it many times. Trust in the Lord. It does not say trust in your desires, hormones, drives, data that you found on Google. Like, ultimately, you trust in the Lord. With what? All of your heart. It's not, it doesn't mean heart that's beating inside your chest right now. Heart is the biblical understanding of your driver. It's the place you make your, your, your decisions of will, which says like, I'm going to go do this thing. I'm going to sleep with that person. I'm going to view this thing on the computer. I'm going to go take this job. It's, a, it's the part of your, your will that goes, I'm going to go get this, that thing. That's called your heart. It's your wanter. It's the things you want in life. So it says, trust in the Lord with all of your wanter. With the thing that you're like, I want to do this thing. But whoa, let's, let's hold up for a second. Let me make sure it's godly. So I trust in God, not in my feelers ultimately. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, so this is it. In all your pathways, in all of your journeys, every journey, parenting journey, trust in God. Um, marriage journey, trust in God. Occupational journey. All these things, all these major things, trust in God, not in my own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your what? Your paths. You're wondering about school? You're wondering what major to take? You're wondering what job to go for? You're wondering all these things? Take it to God. Why? Because God already knows the end. You and I don't know the, the journey, but God already knows where it's going. So why wouldn't you trust the God that loves you and he already knows where you're going? It doesn't... Here's the point. It's nonsensical to say, I don't really know if God knows where I'm going. But I do. So I trust myself. No, Scripture says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Number one, Jesus proclaims a new journey. There's going to be many journeys that uh, some of us are on that we, we want to be on and some that we don't want to be on. I'll give you an example. Um, about December or January of this year, there will be many babies in our nursery. They were the COVIDites. Um, see, many women right now don't even realize that there's a new journey they're going to be on. And their body is going to tell them in a, in a little bit, oh, hey, we're on a new journey together of bringing children into the world because of our COVID time with our spouse. So understand, some of these journeys are like, I didn't want to be prego, and all of a sudden I'm prego over the summer when it's 158 degrees, right? So watch, so, some journeys you're like, I didn't sign up for this, but I'm on it anyway. Some journeys are like, I totally want to do this, you know, yay, whatever, new job or whatever it is. Here's the point. The point is, you, whether you choose it or don't choose it, it doesn't even matter. Because there are journeys you will be on that you either have to trust God or you trust yourself. And which leads us to number two. Number one, Jesus proclaims a new journey. Number two, the disciples are perishing on the journey. Have you ever felt like you were dying? Have you ever felt like I just can't handle anymore? I want to throw my kids in the straight. Don't do that. I can't, ha I can't handle anymore. I'm emotionally just spent, physically exhausted, mentally just cooked. You ever felt like, I think I might die? Well, guess what? The disciples did, and they were even with Jesus. So look at this. When they pushed off from shore, the weather was calm, and the sailing was manageable. Leaving Capernaum, which I showed you on the map, and depending on where they landed on the eastern shore of Galilee, it was about a four to five mile journey that could have taken a few hours. So look at this. Uh, here's, here's a picture of me and a couple of my friends when we went to Israel last time. These are, these are my videographers and a sound guy we brought. And I'm showing you this picture because I'm standing on Mount Ebal, which is a few hundred feet above the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is directly on our backs right there. And Capernaum is just over my right shoulder along the shoreline behind us. And the reason I tell you that is this, ready? I'm gonna give you some facts. I'm gonna give you a factoid. And then if you, if you win Jeopardy, 
tithe, tithe to the church on this, okay? The lowest freshwater lake in the world is the Sea of Galilee. It is almost a thousand feet below the Mediterranean Sea. So if the mountains weren't in the way, it would be covered. So the lowest freshwater lake where fish live and you can actually do fishing is the Sea of Galilee. Guess what? It has a bunch of inlets, but it only has one outlet. You know where it goes south? It goes south to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is the lowest lake in the world. Ready? The reason it's called the Dead Sea is because it has no outlet. It's the lowest lake in the world. It doesn't flow anywhere lower than itself. Over the centuries, evaporation has happened. It's become so uh, alkaline and salty that animals can't live there. They can't drink the water. It'll kill them. So the Sea of Galilee, beautiful, fresh water, flows into one of the worst, really, literally the worst sea in the world because it has no outlet. It just has an inlet. The reason I tell you that is this. This is so low, Sea of Galilee, so low, wind comes ripping down the mountains onto the Sea of Galilee, literally in a minute of, a matter of minutes, and it starts stirring the water. So what you're seeing here in our passage is that uh, the disciples get in this boat, and they're all fishermen. They get in the boat, and they're like, Jesus is like, we're going across the lake. And they're like, cool, I, I, I live on this lake. I, I'll get us there. Start rowing. About a half an hour later, literally in a matter of about 15 minutes, you can go from a beautiful day like we're standing there to if you're out on the lake and you're not in a decent boat, you're dead. You won't get home. You can't swim home. You're smoked. And that's, that's what's happening in the story. That's the reason I show you this picture is they went from, oh, we'll just row across the lake to I think we're going to be dead. And that's how fast things happen on the Sea of Galilee. Here is a picture of a boat that they found from the first century. We will see this in the museum when we go there. Uh, look at this boat. Imagine having 13 grown up men in that boat. That thing's like low riding in the water, right? Like, hey, I, I, did, I did ministry in Pomona. We had a bunch of low riders that, you know, it was legit. I may look pasty white, but I did some ministry down the ghetto, okay? You imagine that boat, 13 grown up men sitting in this boat and Jesus goes, let's go to the other side. And they're like, of course. So everybody grabs an oar and they start, you know, going across the water. Maybe halfway through, storm comes ripping and they go, okay, uh, you know, they're low in the water, waves are coming over, rain's coming down. Jesus sacked out asleep, exhausted out of his mind from the tour he's been doing. He's laying up in the front of the boat, just sleeping, probably snoring. Imagine hearing like God snore, right? So Jesus is snoring in the front of the boat. Then they realize, now understand, these guys aren't like, oh, I'm kind of scared by a little water. Or like, I don't want to break a nail because I haven't been on the water. You know, I'm like a computer guy or whatever. Uh, nope. You know what? These guys, these guys are fishermen, hardcore, let's get into water and handle it, men. So when they say we're going to die, death's coming. Because they weren't like some, you know, wimpy old guys going, I don't even know, the water's scary. These guys are like, dude, this is my life. But when I think we're going to die, okay, this is legit death coming to meet us. And so they wake Jesus up. Imagine Jesus like, I just need a couple hours to not do anything. <laughs> and they're like, Jesus, shaking Jesus awake. And you know, imagine like you come out of those deep sleeps and you're like, what, what? Jesus, the wind and the water. What? You woke me up for that? Like you scared you're going to die, so you woke me up? Okay. Hey, hey, knock it off. Hey, knock it off. And the, the, the Greek construction there gives the idea like Jesus just got up and went, enough. And the wind and the waves go, okay, we're cool. Because guess what? Creation knows when its creator speaks to it. And he goes, enough, I'm, I'm done with this. And imagine the disciples are like, we almost died. And now what just happened? Let's look at it. Ready? Being exhausted, Jesus goes to sleep in the front of the boat. Suddenly a windstorm begins to batter and swamp the boat. And here's the principle. Even journeys with Jesus have their moments of difficulty. Woo! Let me, let me hammer this into your mind. Ready? Many times we think, hey, I'm walking with God. There shouldn't be a problem. When you walk with Jesus, like everything goes great. I'll give you an example. I got married to my wife. 
I don't know, a couple decades ago, whatever it's been now. Sorry, Julie. Something like 25, 26 years ago. So it's been a minute, and I'm only 28 years old. It's weird. <laughs> I got married when I was two. They did things different back then. Ready? So I've been married like 25, 26 years. But I remember, so, so I prayed about it. I've been, I, would, I prayed my whole teenage years for my wife. Didn't know who she was. My grandparents have been praying for my wife uh, my whole life. Like, because a man, a man's deepest influencer is his wife. A man is not more influenced by, by somebody in his whole, literally a man's life will change by either having a good wife or a wife that isn't godly. So they've been praying my, my whole life for my wife. Well, Julie, uh, you know, is a Christian. She comes to know the Lord, legit follower of Jesus, She's smoking hot. So she checked two boxes. I'm done. That's about all I needed. And, uh, so I'm like, I, I got counsel from my pastor and other people in my life. And like, they were like, yeah, you know, I think you, should, you guys should get married. And, um, and so we ended up getting married. Well, here's the thing. I knew that was God's will. And it was, I, I knew I was following God in marrying her, put it that way. But guess what? About 15 minutes after you get married, you get your first fight on, on your honeymoon or whatever. And then like 30 minutes later, you're like, why did I even do this? Why am I even married? Right? For all of us that have been married, you know that even when you're following God, even when you're trying to do the right thing, there's going to be storms that come. There's going to be challenges. So one, I want to encourage you for, in, in one thing, that understand that when you follow God, it's not a matter of like, oh, I hope everything goes well. When you follow God, you're going to get challenges. But the beauty is that God goes with you in the challenge. God goes with you into your marriage. God goes with you into your parenting. God goes with you into your new job. God goes with you wherever you go. The, so here's my point. You're like, well, if atheists go through storms and Christians that go through storms, then, then what's the point? The point is God. Everybody goes through storms. But the difference is that God goes with you. God knows where you're going and he will be with you as you go. Every other choice is just you going, I hope I can handle it. And there's going to be moments you go, maybe I'm dying. And it's in those moments you're going to want God to be guiding your life. As seasoned fishermen, the disciples fear that they are perishing and they go to wake Jesus. When Jesus told them where they were headed before as they entered the boat, it had already guaranteed the outcome. However, they were required to exercise faith on the way. And here's the thing. The journey is less about the destination and more about who you become along the way. Woo! Because many times we think this. Oh, the, the, the point of this story is them getting to the other side of, of the lake. No, actually the point of this story is a storm came and, it, and we got to see how they responded. So watch, your life is not a matter of your destination. Your life is a matter of who you become. Listen, everybody pay attention to me. Ready? If God just wanted you in heaven, he'd just go, everybody to heaven. So then why are we, why are we still here dealing with drama and finances and just heavy issues. Why? Let's just, let's just go to heaven. Let's just fast forward everything and just get there. What's the point? I'll tell you what the point is. The point is, is that difficulty brings out either the warrior or the weakling. You find out where you're at, not when things are easy. You find out where you're at when things start going off the rails. You find out who you trust when the storm rolls through. When water starts coming in the boat, you go, e either Jesus is in this boat with me or I left the port without Jesus. And that's a bad day. Here's the, here's the principle. Rough journeys expose who you trust. Wow. Write that in your, in your mind. Rough journeys expose who you trust. You know, when you find out who you trust is when you're stressed out. Where you take your stress is, is, is who runs your life or what runs your life. Let me give you an example. So when I'm super stressed out, uh, you know, I'm going right to the bottle. Because I know like once I get a couple drinks in me, man, I'm just, I feel calm. I feel like, oh, okay, I can handle this. You know, I'm the life of the party because I loosen up a little bit and then blah, 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 blah. Or, you know, right, when I stress out, man, I go right to porn. Because I know porn's always there for me. You know, at least I'll have a, I'll have a pseudo relationship for a little while. And it's better than nothing. Or, you know, when, when I start stressing out, I start looking for another relationship. Because this one's just gotten stale or whatever. And I'm just going to look for somebody else. 
You know, when I stress out, I, I get really angry and I just start throwing stuff and I just start breaking things. Or if people get in the way, then they get broke too. The point is this, where you take your stress, where, you, where, your, where your valve of releases for your inner heart issues is who you trust. And if it's not God, you're just making up something that'll help like medicate the moment. So my encouragement to you is this, listen to me. Regardless of, of, of how you function in difficulty, and some of it might be super unhealthy and ungodly, in those moments, here's what I would encourage you to do. Is in your moment of weakness, take it right to Jesus. God, help me in this moment. You know I'm lonely. I don't want to sleep around. Help, help, me, to, help me to find my, my identity and my security in you. God, in this moment, I want to drink. I'm just, the bottle's calling me, and I try to get rid of it, and you know it's a, it's a struggle for me. Help me in this issue. God, I live in downtown Pomona, and I know where the drug dealer is so I can find some pot. I just want to smoke, and that I can just eat chips and watch Netflix and pretend like everything's okay. Nope. You take your, you take your stresses to Jesus, and you leave them there. Go, God, help me in this storm. I'm tired of watching. I don't want to view porn anymore, God. I just feel gross, and it's, it's fake, and it's garbage. Help me, help me to overcome that weakness in my life, God. Walk, walk with me in my storm. And you'll be amazed. Here, listen to me. Once the rush of like, do it, do it, do it, washes by, you'll be amazed how all of a sudden there's peace. You'll be amazed. Many of us have never gotten to that point because we've, we've always defaulted to our weaknesses. We haven't allowed God to let the storm wash by because we've taken our, our, our heart anxieties to him. I want to encourage you with that. God loves you. And he wants to see greatness in your life, but greatness will only come when we continually give our lives to him and not always default back to our weak areas. Number one, Jesus proclaims a new journey. Sometimes we're on journeys we don't want to be on. Number two, the disciples are perishing on the journey. Sometimes you're going to hit a storm even when God is with you. And lastly, number three, Jesus is powerful during the journey. I love this part. When you're in the storm, which many of us are in a storm right now, we have to turn to God. God has to be our default mode. As the disciples shook Jesus awake and cried out, Master, Jesus rebuked the weather, instantly stopping it. And I love this. Look at this. Sometimes you don't know who the master is until you realize it's not you. So when I, you know, when I was younger, when you're a young boy, you know, if you got a good relationship with your dad, you, oh, you, you want to do man things. Right? So when my son was younger, Caleb, he's 20 now, but when he was younger, uh, four, five, six years old, you start, to, you start to try to figure out who you are. Like, what do men do? What do women do? How do men dress? How do women dress? Like, how, you find your identity in, in people you look up to. And so Caleb, I can remember when he was about that age, you know, there were times when, you're, when they're super young, they're like a chap attached to mom. You know, they're like mom, mom's love on their little boys and their little girls or whatever. And there comes a point though, where they kind of go, I want to do, I want to do man things. And I remember him saying that, you go, dad, I want to, I want to do man work. And I go, what's Caleb, what's man work? I didn't even know what he was talking about. I'm like, we never even, we don't talk like that at home. Like, I'm like, Hey babe, I'm going to go out to do the man work. So you know, I'll be, I'll be back after I do man work in the garage. Never, never we even talk like that. But I can remember Caleb going, I want to do man work. I'm like, what's man work, Caleb? He goes, I, don't, I just want to do stuff like you do. And I'm like, okay. So I went on the garage and like created a project for him, you know, like with my screw gun or whatever, like a <laughs> piece of wood, something that made sound and created dust or whatever. And like, he thought it was the best thing ever, right? Like this is, this is man stuff. We're, we're doing man things, right? And, uh, and so it was funny that I would come home sometimes and catch him doing man stuff, you know, like working in, the, working in the garage with some of my tools or whatever. And there came a point where there was some stuff he couldn't do. And while he could pretend to be dad, it wasn't until dad showed up that you realized who daddy was. There, and, and the same thing is true in our lives. Sometimes we think, oh, I got this. I can do this. But man, it isn't until you realize, I thought I was the master of what was going on until the real master shows up. And these disciples were fishermen. They're like, dude, I'm not scared of no water. And then they go, we're going to die. I'm scared. And then Jesus shows up and then you realize, 
Okay, daddy's here. Now, now we see who daddy is. I thought I was doing man work. I'm not even a man. Like, that's a man. Like, congratulations, welcome to manhood. There it is. I love this story because you know what happens? As they get in the boat, they're like, oh, dude, we got this. Start rowing across, storm comes, we're gonna die. They shake Jesus awake and all of a sudden Jesus goes, hey, enough, enough already. Everything calms down. And you know what happens? The disciples who were scared of what was happening outside the boat, all of a sudden because, become scared of who's in the boat. They go, who is, who is this? Let the wind and the waves listen. Like, who is this guy? Like, I was scared I was going to die in a minute, like we were going to drown. All of a sudden, I see Jesus go, everybody, this is enough. And everything comes down, and I go, whoa. When the master's here, you know you, ain't, you, you know you ain't that. Because now dad's here. And I want to encourage you with that. In the storm, reach out to God. And my encouragement to you is, is also, don't wait until you're about ready to die. When the storm starts to come, reach out to God. Hit God first, second, and last. After calming the weather, Jesus questioned where their faith was. And here's the, here's the principle. Faith not only has an occasion, which is there's a moment that you have to choose if you're going to trust God, but also a location, meaning there is a place to put your faith, and it's, a, it's in the person of Jesus. Let me tell you, how, let me tell you a, a discouraging moment for me. Um, we saw, uh, you know, Mr. Floyd get killed. And I'm praying their family gets justice because no one should die like that. Literally, that was like at least third degree murder. Let him die under custody, which is unacceptable and horrible. But I tell you one thing it did, you know what? It lit a fire of, of, of a cultural uh, fire in our, in our culture. And it's, we, have, we are hitting such a huge storm right now with COVID and then with this happening. I mean, I talked to Robert. I walked down the hallway to Robert, who's our discipleship pastor, and I go, we got health. We got health storms. We got a cultural storm. You know, what's coming next? Like pretty soon there's going to be a forest fire that rolls through. I mean, we're going to have a health issue. Maybe we'll have an earthquake. I mean, how much more can we handle as a culture just as we walk along these roads? And I, I tell you how I was really discouraged was People were asking me like, hey, how are you going to respond? How are you going to respond? And my response was this. I am pro-protest. We are a nation built on protest. We started this nation as a protest. I am pro-peaceful protest. You see something not right? You see some garbage happening? Then you have every right in America to stand up and go, this is wrong. And we got some, we got some trash in the house of America that we need to deal with. But here's the issue. Our issue was, my issue was this. I heard Christians saying the same lines as the whole culture was saying, rather than standing up and going, the, the answer is Jesus. The answer is the gospel. The government doesn't change men and women's hearts. God changes men and women's hearts. And if there's prejudice that's happening, you know who, you know who can fix that? Is Jesus. And I was so, I expected our culture to stand up and go crazy and, you know, this is unjust and blah, blah, blah. I, I expect that. But you know what I expected out of Christians? I expected at least Christians to stand up and go, hey, there are things we need to work on in, our, in this culture. But let me tell you, the ultimate answer is Jesus, is the gospel. Because God changes the prejudice of men and women. Regardless of where it comes from. Ready? I'm gonna lay a bomb, I'm gonna lay a nuclear bomb right in your lap. Get ready. Ready? Stop using the word racist and racism. There's no such thing as racist and racism. There's one race in the world. And that's the human race. Racism is not only grammatically, but it's also biblically incorrect. And here's the reason I tell you that. And this is what I told some of my Christian friends, other pastors and worship leaders and stuff. I'm like, here's the issue. We're, st you, we're using racism as like there's a black race and a white race and an Asian race and a Mexican race and a whatever. And it's like, you're already speaking separatist language trying to move back to unity. That's stupid. You, you work from unity, how are we all unified? And then say, why aren't we unified and work on the issues? You start from unity language and work out to why there's issues. So watch, I, that's what I told him. I said, you need to work from this, from this standpoint. God created us all equal, regardless of this, the color of your skin or socioeconomic status or whatever. We are one race under God. 
And if there's issues with any of us, we take it to Jesus because the gospel changes men and women's hearts, not governments, not our, not our president standing up with a Bible like a, like a prop in front of a church. I don't trust the president. I don't trust our government. I don't trust anybody else except I trust Jesus because I know Jesus changes people's lives, not only for now, but for eternity. And you know what? I pray for justice. I pray for justice for the Floyd family. I pray that, that the prejudice that's in, our, that's in our culture and in our society changes. I pray, that, I pray that everything is right, but I, you know what I pray for ultimately? I pray that Jesus shines, shines great in the, in the cultural chaos of this moment. And you know how Jesus shines great? is when Christians stand up and go, I know we've got things to work on, but Jesus is the way forward. I can tell you how disgusted I was by some worship leaders who stood behind keyboards for 20 years telling people about how awesome Jesus is and you know, how we should trust Jesus and some pastors that have stood up and they're, they're spewing this racist, it's sharing racist memes and all this junk. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? If there's ever a moment for Jesus to shine, it's right now. If there's ever a moment where we can go, the government can't fix this. Ultimately, the gospel's got to come to the, to the table. And who's going to do that if Christians don't do it? Who's going to do it in the storm of our culture and reach out and go, hey, there's hope? If Christians don't do it, no one's going to do it. So here's my encouragement to you. Stop using the word racism. You know what the word you should use? is prejudice. Because it's prejudice based on skin color. And that's, that's the sinful reality. We're all one race and we got issues we got to work out. But we don't start from separation and try to come back to community. We start with why we are community, which we are the human race built by God, equal in God's sight. And if we got issues, then we work out to fix those issues, but we are always all one. And the reason I tell you that is this. I was a pastor in Pomona, which I've told you already, low riding, right? We had every, every skin color there. And you know, one of the biggest prejudices I dealt with in my youth ministry was dark-skinned black guys being prejudiced against light-skinned black guys because they weren't black enough. And I'm like, what is it? That, that totally changed my way of speaking about it. That I realized there isn't a black race and a white race and an Asian race. We're all one race, but there's just prejudice based on skin color inside of our sinful hearts. So how do we fix our sinful hearts? The gospel. We need Jesus to transform how we think and how we view people because we should be loving people to the, to the truth of the gospel, not creating division and hate. That's garbage. And for Christians not to even bring that to the table is absolutely inexcusable. There's a guy I did worship ministry with who, who had some of the most unhelpful, racist, trash. He's a black guy. And I, I, I messaged him and I go, what are you doing? You've been, you've been helping people sing about the gospel for 20 years, man. And in the moment we need the gospel the most, you're speaking like our culture. Speak the truth, but speak it in love. Speak the gospel, man. In the storm, find Jesus. Go shake Jesus awake if you think he's sleeping. Don't just stand up in a storm and start vomiting stuff. People need the gospel. Dude, I don't even know what I'm doing. That's a whole other sermon. Okay, here we go.